Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to a brand new edition of geek to me Radio, episode 270. Today we're joined by Brian Volpe, talking about a brand new documentary series that he has out, The Center Seat, 55 Years of Star Trek, coming to the History Channel. You can check out that. We'll talk more about Star Trek with Brian and more. Stand by. And for those of you hearing us for the very first time, welcome to geek to me Radio. I'm your host, James Enstall. Every week, we try to bring you a brand new guest from the world of pop culture, be it TV, movies, comic books, and or video games. And for those longtime listeners, welcome back to you. We always appreciate your being here. 270 episodes in, coming up on the big 300th. If you have suggestions for what you might like to hear on the 300th episode of geek to me Radio, send me an email, geek to me radio at gmail.com put in 300th show in the subject line and we'll be reading some of those suggestions off live on the air on our sunday shows on the big 550 ktrs at 10 p.m eastern 7 p.m pacific every sunday with that said uh this is a fantastic show i'm a huge fan of brian volkwees we've had him on the show a few times and i'm a huge fan of star trek so with that said let's dive in Right now, we're proud to welcome back Brian Volkwies. Uh, We've had him on the show before talking about the movies that made us, the Christmas movies that made us, a toy store near you, uh, uh, just a slew of fantastic projects. But now we're going to delve into Star Trek with the brand new series, The Center Seat, 55 years of Star Trek coming this fall to the History Channel. Brian, welcome back to the show. Uh, thank you for having me back. And it's, by the way, it's, it's, it's only about two weeks away. So it's, uh, we are in the fall, I think. I'm not the best with seasons but uh yeah it's it's november 5th yeah it's hard to believe that we're coming up on november already because it seems like we you know we're still in summer here not that long ago but it's it's uh surprising how quickly it it progresses forward i mean not to say it's always cliched but i i cannot believe we're in october yeah it's 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 uh this year and maybe i think it's a result of having gone through 2020 which seemed to be the longest year of any year ever uh that maybe this year is just flying by in comparison but be that as it may yeah we're going to be able to take a look at this and your press people were very kind and sent me the first episode to look at uh we'll start with gates mcfadden who just we had her on the show not that long ago talking about her brand new podcast investigates and i guess she seemed kind of the natural choice for this obviously she's got a great voice she's knowledgeable about the series having been in it uh was she your first choice for the narrator for this project um you know, it's a really good question. Um, it, it, as crazy as this may sound to anybody that has never made a documentary, um, the hardest thing, in my opinion, from my point of view, about making a documentary is picking the voiceover. So when the show was greenlit, we really didn't know who would do the voiceover. And, um, you know, it was only when we were almost locking the first episode that it was time to start thinking about voiceover. And, you know, like I said, it's such a delicate decision. I mean, every show we do, people complain about our voiceover. It's just a matter of, is it 1% or is it 50%? So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very delicate thing. And to be completely honest with you, it's my second least favorite. By the way, it's a list of like two or three things. I, I have the greatest job ever. But on the list of stuff I do not enjoy about my job, uh, 
Uh, that's number two uh, <laughs> on a list of uh, two or three is picking voiceover. But it, it just, I can't, I'll be completely honest, like I just kept delaying the decision because, like I said, I, I don't like the topic. So when it got to the point where everybody was saying to me, Brian, Brian, you got to decide, you got to decide. I had, you know, we were already making her podcast, Gates McFadden's podcast, and, you know, she and I had a great relationship. So, oh, but I'm leaving out a big part of the story. I'm sorry. The original deal that we did with Gates was just to be an executive producer. So she was already working on the show. So, but it was just as an executive producer. And only after I had uh, procrastinated for weeks and I finally had to make a decision about who should do the voiceover, I was like, well, Gates is awesome as a producer. She's awesome as a person and she has a fantastic voice. Why not her? And by the grace of God, she agreed to do it. No cajoling necessary? She immediately just said yes, or was it a little bit of arm twisting? No, there was a little arm twisting, and even that's not an accurate term. I mean, I had to convince her to be an executive producer on the show. Uh, You know, that didn't, you know, I didn't ask her, and she said yes in the same phone call. Very understandably, by the way. But um, that being said, um, you know, she... um, she, you know, she thought about it and then she agreed to do the show. Um, but by the time I asked her about the voiceover, we were already in business. And um, that was, she said, I mean, I had to do a deal with her agent, but as it relates to if she wanted to do it or not do it. Yes. She said yes on the phone call for the voiceover. And it's it's great to have, obviously, it, it seems like a natural fit because obviously you want someone who's familiar with the project and Star Trek being, you know, in her wheelhouse, uh, having her voice kind of narrate and kind of navigate you through this. It just, it feels so natural. It's like an old friend kind of telling you a story, which I I think it's a great choice to have her do this. Well, you're very kind. And you know, one of the things I I just want to say, and I hope she doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but the original contract we did with her to be an executive producer I mean, to be completely honest with you, it was like two or three pages and it literally listed everything that I needed to do for her. (laughs) But there was very little in the contract about what she had to do for the show. You know, when I had spoken to her, I basically told her, I'm like, you know, listen, uh, you know, I really would just because you were there, it would be great to have someone like you watching the cuts and giving us your notes to make sure that it's good creatively, but also historically accurate. And that was really it. But once the deal was done, I mean, let me put it this way. Without Gates, there's no Kate Mulgrew. There's no Brett Spiner. There's no Rick Berman. I mean, she booked all of them. Wow. Yeah. Um, So it's, it's very rare in my career that something like this happens, but I gotta be honest with you. I, because I already knew Gates and I was already in business with her looking back. No, I'm not surprised at all. She's, she's a very good person. She's also a very hardworking person and she's also a very passionate person. So if she said she wanted to be a part of the doc, then she's one of these people like it's either 10 out of 10 or I'm not doing it. Yeah. So after she said yes, she was, as I knew she would be, you know, a 10 out of 10. And with the story of Star Trek, there's so many different levels, obviously going all the way back. And I love the first episode literally starts you at the very beginning, a very good place to start with uh, Lucille Ball and the uh, her company kind of green lighting Star Trek, giving Gene Roddenberry the chance going back to the pilot, having to shoot a second pilot. And there's things, I I consider myself a Trekkie, but there are things I didn't even know. And that's one of the things, you've got this, almost a formula, you've got it down pat now with the toys that made us and the movies that made us, all this behind the scenes, all this great information that you lay out. So I I shouldn't expect anything less, but I'm still astonished just the amount of information that you get 
in the first episode for things like a person like me didn't even know. So that's a great launching platform to then go off into exploring the original series in more depth and the animated series and the next generation. So it, it makes you more excited going forward for the next episodes to come. So kudos there again. And we're going to stop right there, take a quick commercial break, come back and chat more with Brian Volkwies. Please stand by. Hi, this is Gates McFadden. Now, don't tell my space son, but I always listen to Geek to Me Radio. Do it. Welcome back to Geek to Me Radio. Want to make sure we tell you about our movie sponsor, Marcus Theaters. MarcusTheaters.com is the website. There are locations for Marcus Theaters and Movie Tavern in a whole bunch of different states. Illinois, Arkansas, Iowa, Colorado, Minnesota, Georgia, Missouri, Kentucky, Nebraska, Louisiana, North Dakota, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Texas, Virginia, and we already mentioned Wisconsin as well because you can get a Movie Tavern and a Marcus Theaters in that state. Uh, It's really the best way to see a movie. We just saw Eternals in IMAX at Marcus Theaters at the Ronnie's location, actually, here in St. Louis. And whether or not you like the Eternals, I know some people have, it's been a little mixed reviews. If you're going to see a movie, see it in the best possible surroundings, MarcusTheaters.com. You can also get early access screening uh, to Sing 2. Lots of movies coming out. Clifford the Big Red Dog. And, of course, there. if you haven't seen some of the movies that are still out in theaters right now, No Time to Die, the new James Bond movie. And, of course, uh, Last Night in Soho, The French Dispatch. A lot of great movies to be seen. And if you're wondering what to get people, supply chain shortages are out there. Christmas shopping might be a bit of a hassle. Get them a Marcus Theaters or Movie Tavern gift card. Right now, 15% off gift card purchases of $25 or more. So give the gift of movies because I, it's one of the things I like to do during the holidays, if we get some time off, hey, let's go see a movie. And we head over to our Marcus Theater. Download the Marcus Theater's app as well for your smartphone or uh, iPhone, you know, whatever phone you have, or your device, your iPad or whatever. And you can order your tickets right there off the app. If you're out and about and you've got your phone, well, I'm not sure where we are or what's the closest theater. Let the app do the work for you. Book your tickets. You can even order your concessions right there on the app as well for a more contactless experience. And make sure to become a member of their Magical Movie Rewards program so you get points for seeing movies and buying concessions that you can then use those points to see more movies and get more concessions. It's always a great time at the movie theater, and there's no better place to see it than at a Marcus Theater or Movie Tavern location. Once again, go to the website, Marcus theaters.com and as we always say here it's the best movie going experience in the galaxy chatting with brian volkwies the rest of this hour and we were talking right before the break about crafting this series the center seat 55 years of star trek history well i'm, I'm very appreciative that you said that and that you thought that because i mean that is entirely what we try to do you know, as you may know, you know, we partner up a lot with the Tenudos, you know, Mary Jo and John Tenudo, who are literally sociology professors that teach a class about Star Trek. Mm-hmm. And when they saw our first episode, um, it's one of the greatest compliments we've ever received. Um, they said not only did they not see any mistakes, but they learned new things. And these are people that for 20, 30 years, have been teaching Star Trek. Hmm. So to, for them to learn new stuff. But, you know, one of the things you mentioned, I just want to, you know, highlight, because it's something I've been very passionate about for five or six years. Actually, not five or six years. I've been trying to do it for five or six years. But I've been passionate about it since I was like 12 or 13. It There's a very strange dividing line between books about Star Trek and documentaries about Star Trek. Mm -hmm. In the books about the making of Star Trek, they're extremely honest, and they say everything. But for some reason, the documentaries about Star Trek seem to, like, round a lot of edges, and, like, you know, they, they don't talk about certain things. And one of the things that is very apparent in every book I have ever read about Star Trek getting greenlit the first time and the fact that Star Trek exists was it's very clear 
that Lucille Ball is the mother of Star Trek if Gene Roddenberry is considered the father of Star Trek. Yeah. But she never gets the credit in documentaries. She always gets the credit in books. So one of the things I've been trying to do, for, like I said, for five or six years, uh, I was not allowed to do it for a variety of reasons when we did the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. And I, I did do it in the Toys That Made Us Star Trek episode. So I, I did do it. But the Toys That Made Us episode was about toys. So I really couldn't do the deep dive into what I consider to be shining a light on somebody who doesn't get enough credit, in this case, Lucille Ball, um, really like giving her her due. Because I, there's a saying I heard a long time ago that I think is one of the most true things I've ever heard, which is creativity without implementation is negligence. And Gene Roddenberry had the creativity, but Lucille Ball implemented. And she didn't implement once. She implemented twice. Yeah. Because as you know, the pilot wasn't picked up originally, and she put that bill. So she was already in the red after one pilot, and then she had to dig into her pocket for a second pilot. So if the second pilot hadn't been greenlit, she would have been out – you know, I think what in today's money would have been around $4 million. So, again, I'm not taking anything away from Gene. But, yeah, there's no Star Trek without Lucille Ball and Gene Roddenberry. And it's so interesting to think about that in the context of today's streaming services and everything. We, we just saw this week why The Last Man was canceled. Uh, Jupiter Ascending on Netflix was canceled after one season. So we see these projects that have these great promise just cast aside. And then we hear the stories of going back to the 60s with what happened with Star Trek being almost confined to the dustbin. And it, it's, it, it really provides a stark contrast between today with all these different platforms where you can literally release a show on YouTube, like with uh, Cobra Kai, and then you've got, you know, back in the day when you only had three networks. It, it's, it's such a fascinating contrast in the fact that this beloved show, here we are celebrating the 55th anniversary, almost didn't get made. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's really crazy. And the story I always tell... To, to people that are not in the business, I'm always like, here's all you have to know about pilots. Comedy Central made a pilot with Kevin Burr, and it wasn't greenlit to series. And by the way, this wasn't in like 1998. This was in like 2010 or something. So like, if that doesn't get on the air, that really shows you how delicate the process is. No kidding. Yeah, it's 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 amazing because everything is driven by money nowadays. And, you know, we, we hear the, how Seinfeld almost got canceled after its first season. If something's not profitable anymore, immediately it goes away, no matter the critical acclaim. Uh, so, it, so again, as you said, had it not been for Lucille Ball, we wouldn't be having this conversation about Star Trek 55 years later. So uh, thank you for shining that light on someone who was so instrumental. Well, we uh, we tried. We tried. I hope people dig it. And when you were going through this, obviously there's all the chapters to take into consideration. The animated series, which is, is usually overlooked. A lot of people, to even today, will be like, there was a Star Trek cartoon? It's like they don't know. And then, obviously, other, other episodes will focus on DS9 and things like that. Which one for you was, uh, from a personal standpoint even, a highlight for you to work on? We're going to take another quick break. Come right back and get that answer from Brian Volquist after this. Please stand by. Hi, this is Michelle Nichols, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. Welcome back to Geek to Me Radio. I want to make sure we tell you about our premier sponsor, the Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau. Long-time listeners of the show will know the website I'm about to say because I've said it since we started the show in August of 2016, Discover stcharles.com that's discover stcharles.com saint abbreviated not spelt out um if you're going to get out and do something new here maybe you you know you've been quarantined long enough uh, you want to get out and about now that we're seeing the light at the end of the covid tunnel 
Get out and support small businesses. That's very important, especially during this holiday season. So go to St. Charles and check out all the shops there are along the way there. There's all these cool, unique gift ideas. Literally, if you go up and down, you will find something for everyone on your Christmas list. And (laughs) talking about Christmas, there's not a better time, in my humble opinion, to go visit St. Charles than during Christmas because they have Christmas traditions. The street is all lit up. And they've got all the characters walking around out there, international Santas from around the world, Père Noël from France, Father Christmas from England, Santa Lucia from Sweden. And then they've got all the other, the Dickensian characters like Bob Cratchit and Tiny Tim are out there walking around. Wednesday nights, they've actually got Dickensian Christmas night, so you can go out there and basically watch the whole Christmas carol tableau play out. And of course, Friday nights are Krampusnacht, uh, so you can actually get to get your picture taken with Krampus. And then, of course, Saturdays and Sundays, they always have the big Santa parades and all sorts of stuff going on. The chestnuts, roasting chestnuts over an open fire. And it really does take you back in time to a simpler time when uh, there's not that hustle and bustle of the big corporate stores and everything like that. It's a great place to visit, not just during Christmas, but any time of year. While you're out there, have a holiday cocktail at Tompkins House. Uh, you know, Enjoy the patio with the fire pits at Salt and Smoke. Or uh, Bella Vino, where you can sit there and have a nice glass of wine while you watch the people stroll up and down the cobblestone streets. It, if you haven't been there before, go to the website first. Check that out, discoverstcharles.com. It's really a fantastic place to visit. And if you're hearing this and you're not from the greater St. Louis, St. Charles area, plan a visit. Maybe you've got some time off and you want to take it. Maybe you're one of those uh, companies that you have to use your vacation time or you're going to lose your vacation time if you don't take it before the end of the year. Plan a trip. Come hang out in St. Charles. Stay at a hotel, a little bed and breakfast, whatever suits your fancy, and check out a really cool area that you won't see unless you go to some place like Williamsburg, Virginia, some place like that. But it's this, these old buildings, the cobblestone streets, and when it's lit up for Christmas, there's nothing like it. Once again, plan your trip now. Discover com for an historically good time. Very proud to have them as the premier sponsor here on geek me Radio. Before we took that last break, we were chatting with Brian Volkwies, and I'd asked him, uh, you know, with all the different avenues of Star Trek between the animated series, DS9, Voyager, the original series, which episode, because each episode is centered around a different aspect of Star Trek, which episode of the center seat was a highlight for Brian to work on? The, part, the aspect of Star Trek, which, as you know, literally spans over 55 years now, is the Captain Kirk movies. So that would be Star Trek 1 through basically Star Trek 6, but I guess technically it includes Generations. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so, I mean, that's – Star Trek 2, this is what I always say. It's like Star Wars helped me pick my career choice. Star Trek – and this is Star Trek 2 specifically – Star Trek – gave me like a code in my life to follow. And the majority of that statement ties into Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan. The, when Kirk says, I don't believe in the no-win scenario, that's, I mean, that is literally in my will to be written on my tombstone. <laughs> so, like, that's that's for me the Star Trek, but... So making those episodes, you know, interviewing Nicholas Meyer, like who I literally told him what I just told you, you know, the impact that those words had on me. And it was, it was really crazy, man. I I literally, as I was telling him that, you know, I was saying to him, you know, just so you know, like it, it literally changed my life. Like there's no company. I probably wouldn't even be married to who I'm married to if I didn't have that philosophy of, I don't believe in the no win scenario. And as I was telling him that, I started crying, I have to admit, and I got very embarrassed. And when I looked up, he was crying too. (laughs) So then I was even more embarrassed because I'm like, oh, my God, the crew is looking at these two guys crying. And then I looked around, I swear to God, half the crew was crying. So I feel like that's a great example of answering your question of uh, which which part of Star Trek am I the most passionate about? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd say as as a little kid going to the movies, I'd say the two deaths that affected me the most in movies were the death of Spock at the end of Star Trek Two, and then uh, the death of Optimus Prime in uh, in Transformers the movie. I'd say those as a child, those those are the two that stood with me and uh, had the most impact on me. Yeah, it's funny, you know, Optimus Prime, unlike Spock, dies at the beginning of the movie. So it actually didn't affect me very much because I was positive he would come back. Mm -hmm. 
it was only when the credits started where I'm like, uh, wh- what? And then I remember just getting in the car with my parents. Like, I mean, literally, like, it's like I had survived like a helicopter crash. My parents were like, are you okay? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I just feel really uh, kind of weird. Like, I mean, I, like, it was just so weird. Yeah. Um, but Spock, you knew because it was the end of the movie, he was dead. <laughs> Yeah, and have them kill off a major character like that. Obviously, they they brought him back in the third one, but uh, that it's obviously that was the whole crux of the third movie. But I think some of those huge death and Star Trek's never shied away from that. Like they killed off Tasha Yar in the first season of the Next Generation. That was one thing I think people kept saying. Okay, they're going to bring her back too, right? But I think it's those those big deaths of the major characters that I think Star Trek has done so well. They, they kind of resonate with you because it is that human experience. You lose somebody and that's not always something that other TV shows or series deal with, especially a big franchise like Star Trek. And they've always done it in such a great way. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You're, you're hundred percent right. It's funny. You reminded me of one of my favorite things. Uh, it, some people might be surprised. I didn't know this. Maybe I should be embarrassed, but yeah, they filmed the episode skin of, Evil when she died. That was filmed the day. That was filmed the week before the last episode that she did. But they aired in opposite order. So there is an episode. I don't remember the name. I apologize. I'm not the best with titles. But there's an episode that aired the week before Skin of Evil. And that episode was filmed after Skin of Evil. I just want to make sure I'm explaining this right. And she was filming her last scene ever for her original run. And the camera was literally on the other side of the soundstage as Picard and I believe Troy are walking out of the cargo bay. And all the way in the background, like almost out of focus, is Tasha Yar. And um, Denise Crosby, knowing it was her last day, last scene, last minute, does this, like, big, goofy wave because she was so far out of the shot and she just knew the editors would be able to cut it out of the show. It's in the show. (laughs) So, like, if you go on Netflix right now and you watch that episode, it's the episode right before Skin of Evil – the last shot of the episode, like I said, is I think Picard and Troy walking out the door and um, and you literally see her literally jumping up and waving <laughs> goodbye. And I, like I said, maybe a, a real Trekkie would have known that, but I didn't know that until I was interviewing her and she told the story. I'll have to go. So yeah, now, as soon as I get up with this interview, I'm going to go over and turn on the Netflix and find that episode and watch it just for that port. That's great. It's it is, I cannot stress to you enough. The same way I can't describe to you what uh, Rancho Obi-Wan is like, you have to go. Yeah. This is the same thing. You got to see it because <laughs> you'll fall out of your chair laughing. Especially now knowing the backstory. So thank you for that. That's great. I'm definitely going to go check that one out. Uh, with, with the Star Trek franchise, I feel like everybody, everybody I talk to, no matter the, the hardest diehard Trekkie, fell off at some point. Uh, I know after Next Generation, I watched a little bit of DS9. I watched maybe the first couple of episodes of Voyager. But at some point, there's there's other stuff going on. You go through a life change. For me, it was, you know, going to uh, into, into high school and college and everything like that, where you kind of lose some momentum on the Star Trek. Did you ever have that? Were you a follower all the way through every season of every series? Or was there one that you're not as familiar with? Like for me, I've not seen maybe but two episodes of Enterprise, for example. Well, I, I, I don't know what's typical or not typical, but I kind of had a different relationship with every series. Mm. Um, I, um, I, I gave up. I'll be completely honest with you. I gave up on Deep Space Nine. Okay. Uh, and um, I, about six years ago, my friend Brian Stillman, who's a director I work with a lot, uh, Brian just wouldn't shut up about Deep Space Nine. And I'm like, dude, it sucks. He's like, <laughs> it doesn't suck. You just have to. He, and what he reminded me of that I forgot 
And I'm like, uh, dude, I am surrounded by Star Trek Next Generation figures, t- vehicles, props, you name it. It's all around me right now in this room. But he reminded me, Next Generation wasn't that good the first two seasons. Hmm. So, like I said, about five years ago, thanks to Netflix, I just watched everything. I watched the whole series. And here's what I'll tell you about Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine is some of the best Star Trek ever made the closer and closer they get to the Dominion War. Hmm. And then once the Dominion War starts, it's some of the best Star Trek ever made. So I'm glad I went back. Voyager, similar to what you were saying, Voyager came out um, right when I had gotten into the actual film department of my college. So... I just, I didn't watch Voyager the way I had watched Next Generation. So I, had, I, I didn't dislike it the way I did Deep Space Nine originally, but Voyager as well in a streaming Netflix environment is when I finally got to watch the whole show. Enterprise, on the other hand, Enterprise I think had one of the best, I, I think Enterprise truly is the best pilot of all of Star Trek, hmm. because let's be honest, Star Trek has not been great with their pilots, <laughs> not, nor, nor are most shows, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, anyway, but, like, which is understandable. Like, putting a show together, you have 10 trillion variables. Sure. You know, you got to make guesses on all of them. And then by the time you get to episode two, let alone episode 10, you start to figure out what's working and what's not working. So it's normal to have a weak pilot, but... Enterprise's pilot, it's as good today as it was the first time I saw it. So I actually, like, I love the first season of Enterprise. But, oh, my God, when they start with that Suliban stuff and everything, I mean, it, I tapped out. I have since gone back, and I really do enjoy the show, but I basically love season one and season four. Um, and, uh, not, uh, not as crazy as, uh, about season two and three. And that's, that's to be expected with anything. There's, you know, the Star Wars series, the same way they spawn different series and franchise. Some people don't like the resistance. Some people don't like clone Wars. So there's always something that no matter how big of a fan you are, there's gonna be some things that just don't resonate with you. But the fact that here we are, you know, 55 plus years later, we're now talking about the brand new series. You've got out the center seat, 55 years of Star Trek. The fact that Star Trek is so embedded in the pop culture zeitgeist and the people all over know if you if you spread your hand in, in half and you're making the live long and prosper sign, everyone knows what that is, no matter what language they speak. That's a real testament to Gene Roddenberry's vision and the continued success of the Star Trek franchise. We're going to take another quick break, come back and finish our chat with Brian Volkwies, all about Star Trek, the center seat, 55 years of history for Star Trek. Stand by. Hello, I'm Robert Picardo, the holographic doctor from Star Trek Voyager and Commander Woolsey from Stargate Atlantis. And you are listening to Geek to Me Radio because you are no fool. Welcome back for our final segment here on Geek to Me Radio. Speaking of Geek to Me Radio, check out the website geektomeradio.com. If you want to play around there, you can see all of our back catalog of our other 269 episodes prior to this one. If you're, again, if you're, we mentioned at the top of the show, if you're brand new, you've got a lot of back catalog. Hopefully, you like what you've heard today. We had Brian Volquist on the show. This is probably his third or fourth time, and uh, he's a fantastic guest. But I always try to get great guests who not only I enjoy talking to, but who you, the listener, will like from the world of TV, movies, video games. Uh, just had a great interview with Taylor Gray, who played Ezra Bridger in Star Wars Rebels. But we have we talked to voice actors, we talked to directors, composers, comic book writers, artists, and there's always something I think for everybody. And I love talking to these people. It's one of the great joys of doing the show is the people I get to talk to. So go to geektomeradio.com, play around there, and kind of uh, explore a little bit. And also, if you would, we have a goal to try to get to 1,000 subscribers on our YouTube page before the end of the year. So we have just a little under two months to do it. So if you could, please, if you're listening to this, 
Go to YouTube.com, find geek to me Radio, hit that subscribe button so we can hit our goal of 1,000 subscribers. And, of course, if you're also on social media and you're active there, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at geek to me Radio on both those platforms. Facebook.com slash geek to me Radio if you want to give the page a like there as well. We do the live radio shows on Sundays at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. We try to uh, broadcast or stream those on video, I should say. My executive producer, Joey V., always hooks that up, and he's absolutely brilliant at everything he does. Again, shout out to him because this show would not be going on as long as it did without his help, and he brings the video aspect in there and kind of keeps me on track, makes sure I know what I'm doing when I'm trying to operate the boards on Sunday nights, so he's always a huge help. But yeah, if you want to check out the video, kind of some of the fun things we do during the live show, uh, subscribe to the Facebook page as well, and of course the YouTube channel and twitch.tv, find geek to me Radio there, give us a subscription there as well. We do appreciate your support, it's one of the ways you can help the show. It doesn't cost you anything, just follow us across social media and subscribe to the YouTube page. We do appreciate your help with that. As we took that last break, uh, right before we went away, we were talking with Brian Volkwies about uh, the center seat, 55 years of Star Trek history, uh, debuting on the History Channel. You can catch episodes there. All the other stuff he's done, too, by the way, the the Toys That Made Us, which was a brilliant series on Netflix, the movies that made us, the Christmas movies that made us, all on Netflix, and uh, he's just an amazing talent, all the, the video production he's done, the comedy specials he's uh, kind of overseen. So we always loved having Brian Volkwies on. And as we're wrapping this up, we were discussing Gene Roddenberry's legacy and the enduring power of Star Trek in pop culture. Uh, Absolutely. And it's like, you know, one of the things I always find amazing about Gene Roddenberry is, you know, he pulled this stuff out of his brain. And, I mean, it's, it's I'm reading a comic book right now all about Kirk and Spock. It's called Year Five. Yeah. Like, it it like as you said, it's fifty five years later. It's the same characters. It's the same ship. It's all the same stuff, but it still feels brand new and fresh. Uh, more than half a century later, and I mean, if anything shows you what a genius uh, Gene Roddenberry was, that's it. And with doing this particular documentary, you've had uh, you got the chance to sit down with all these great actors, all these people who have had an imprint on Star Trek. Was there one you just mentioned the Denise Crosby story, which is great? Was there one that you heard a story from that you were you were most fascinated by, or was there a certain uh, actor actress who just captivated you more than one of the others? Uh, I've interviewed well over a thousand people in my career. Uh, I mean, truly, one of the greatest interviews uh, of that thousand is um, uh, Kirstie Alley. I mean, uh, like, it was hysterical, but also, to your point, I got to ask her questions about rumors I've heard my entire life. And she was so honest. Like, she was so honest about why she's not in Star Trek Three. She was so honest about making it a movie. I mean, it was it was truly one of the greatest uh, interviews in my entire career. And I'm I'm always one who preferred Rebecca to Diane when it comes to Cheers too. So that that's uh, I I would love to talk to Kirstie Alley. <laughs> yeah, I I think that will be some of people because again I have conservatively and I I do apologize if I got to jump in a minute less than a minute actually, um, but. Uh, I, I, I've seen Star Trek two conservatively three or four hundred, maybe five hundred times. Wow. She told me stuff that's in the movie that I had never noticed before. She's like, "You never thought it was a little strange? I'm standing there in the turbo lift in a bathrobe. You never noticed that?" <laughs> I'm like, "You know, I've seen that hundreds of times. You're right. It never occurred to me that that's strange. That is strange. Why were you in a bathrobe?" And then she told the story, and it's the greatest thing you ever heard. And I'm sorry to leave you on a cliffhanger, but I, uh, I cannot be late for the next Zoom I'm on. I apologize. No, no worries. Will that a cliffhanger will have us uh, give us an excuse to have you back next time? Uh, Brian Volkwies, the center seat, 55 years of Star Trek. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. It's been fun as always. That's going to do it. Another show in the books. My thanks once again to Brian Volkwies. Make sure you check out the documentary Star Trek. Uh, The Center Seat, 
55 years of Star Trek on the History Channel. Thanks again to Joey V for making the show sound as good as it does and uh, keeping me going as long as you have. Thank you to the listeners out there, all of you who are listening. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at geek2meradio.com. Until next week, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I sound. Thank you, Deep Space Nine. Good night. Hey, kids. Are your parents about to buy you a shiny new toy from Amazon? Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? (coughs) Well, don't be selfish. Share some of that money with us. Before going on Amazon, make sure to type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. It will look just like Amazon.com, except it'll say Referral Geek to Me Radio up top. And then when you check out, a tiny percentage will go to support the show without costing you one cent more. So before your parents get you that gizmo, gadget, or widget, make sure they type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. Bit.ly slash geek to me. Bit.ly slash geek to me.